player and play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, Donald Trump has formally pleaded not guilty to the criminal charges he's facing in a courtroom in New York City. Outside, his supporters have been demonstrating while protesters against the former president have been shouting, lock him up. We now know he's facing 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. Those charges include the allegation he covered up the payment of hush money to the adult film actress Stormy Daniels. LBC's Washington correspondent Simon Marks has been talking to Ian Dale. He says the former president's been very vocal in the last few hours. In the motorcade on his way from Trump town, to the Manhattan Criminal Court. He took to Truth Social saying he's heading to Lower Manhattan, the courthouse, and he wrote, seems so surreal. Wow, they are going to arrest me. Can't believe this is happening in America. And he sent out additional fundraising uh, emails uh, before he left Trump Tower, uh, urging his supporters to get behind him. Also talking to LBC this evening is Lanny Davis, a co-founder of the Washington-based law firm Davis, Goldberg & Gulper. He says a poll carried out by CNN suggests the American people are not all on Mr. Trump's side. Every group in America uh, say that they approve of this indictment and his approval rating is in the 30s. In other news this evening, a mother and her boyfriend have been convicted of killing a two-year-old girl in Pembrokeshire. Lola James was found with more than 100 injuries, including brain damage. Finland's become the newest member of NATO. It's now the 31st member of the organisation after asking to join following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Charities and unions have described the government's move to halve the social care workforce funding in England as a betrayal. Despite a previous promise to invest at least £500 million. The actual figure has turned out to be £250 million. And Amazon has decided to close its UK-based online retailer, Book Depository, later on this month. It was founded in 2004 in Gloucester before being acquired by the company in 2011. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down 38 points at 76.34. The pound buys $1.24 and €1.14. LBC weather, outbreaks of rain for West Scotland and Northern Ireland tonight. Patchy rain spreading east but staying dry in the southeast with a low of minus one degree. From Global's Newsroom for LBC, I'm Tim Daly. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross-question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening and welcome to Tuesday's Cross Question. It's always a little bit awkward when there's a breaking news story when we're doing Cross Question, but we are going to keep you across what's happening in the New York courthouse. Um, a photo has been released of Donald Trump and that's all I think we're going to get. We don't know whether he's going to address the media after uh, the proceedings have finished. I suspect not, but he will be addressing the American people from Mar-a-Lago at 1.15am. So you'll be here, able to hear that live with Richard Spur a bit later on. Let me tell you who's on my panel for Cross Question. To my left is Heidi Alexander, who I think was one of the first people I ever interviewed on LBC back in 2010. Long time ago, Heidi. She's former Labour MP, Shadow Health Secretary and Deputy Mayor of London. And she's now a Labour candidate for the next general election in Swindon South. Or South Swindon, whichever you like. Greg Swenson is next to her, Chair of Republicans Overseas UK, who works in investment banking, but don't hold that against him. Andy Sylvester, to my right, is Editor of the Business Focus newspaper City AM and uh, presents our business update every day on the programme. And Michael Walker is a contributing editor for Navarra Media and host of its Navarra Live show. So many things for you to call in about today. 0345 6060 973. You might want to phone in about Donald Trump. Uh, you might want to phone in about the fact the government has halved the funds it had planned to give to England's social care sector. Rishi Sunak's popularity among Conservative Party members is soaring, but most 
most of the public still don't know what Keir Starmer stands for. TikTok has been fined nearly £13 million for breaching British data laws. Uh, those companies responsible for polluting our rivers and seas will be asked to pay the bill, the full bill, for cleaning them up. That was announced today and teachers in England are going on strike for yet another five days. Plenty to get our teeth into but if you've got another subject you want to phone in about please feel free to do so. 0345 6060 973 84850 on the text and say to Alexa send a comment to LBC and you can put your question that way and we hope you're watching us on Global Player. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, our first question is a text question from Phil in Oxford. Is the accession of Finland to NATO the biggest blunder that Putin has made in the Ukraine war? Uh, Greg. You could argue that. I mean, it's it's got a, a, a very what is it a thousand kilometer or a thousand mile border, and there's some real history there. You know, the the devastating battle they fought. I think it was right before World War II or or at the beginning of World War II. So there's some legacy there, and Finland maintained neutrality for a very long time, and you know, in spite of the fact that you know they were the front line against the Soviet Union. So yeah, this could be this could be a real blunder for Putin. And, and the Finnish people have always traditionally supported being neutral, just as they have it in Sweden. So I think this is a, a major, major story, which has been rather eclipsed today by uh, yeah. events a in, lot of news in the eclipsed. United States. <laughs> yeah. But strategically, also, it is incredibly important. And I haven't seen any comment from the Kremlin today on this, but um, Michael Walker, they must be smarting, I would have thought. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think the war in Ukraine has completely backfired for Putin. I suppose potentially we could overstate how significant the accession of Finland is for Vladimir Putin. Yes, it's got this huge border, but the the association with Ukraine, I think, was more fundamental, more cultural. That was part of the former Soviet Union. Obviously, Finland wasn't. So I do think Vladimir Putin probably sees Ukraine and Georgia differently to that which he does Finland. Um, but clearly, if your aim was to stop NATO expansion and you start a war and then Finland and Sweden join NATO, um, that doesn't seem like an act of strategic genius. Well, particularly genius. because it, it, I mean, NATO has been accused of sort of creeping up on Ru Russia's borders. But I mean, with this massive land border that Finland has, um, I mean, Putin will no doubt want to point that out as much as he can. Absolutely. Well, like, will he want to point that out as much as he can? I, I assume that this is not being talked about much from the Kremlin because they don't particularly want the Russian public to be talking about Finland joining NATO because there aren't many ways you can spin that. Um, so, so I'm not sure how uh, Vladimir Putin would turn that into a win. Andy? Yeah, I mean, I pretty much echo that entirely, I guess. You know, is this, this isn't a blunder, right? You know, it's happened out of his hands. The blunder was was a long time ago when he cooked up a fairly cockamamie plan to invade Ukraine and win a war in three days. Um, you know, we're seeing now the, the logical conclusions, I suppose, of years of botched policy on all sides, um, both in terms of Vladimir Putin's aggression and the West's inability to stand up to it at the time that it should have done, you know, almost a decade ago. The question now is, is, is twofold, really. One... This gives, you know, the mannequin piss in Brussels today was dressed up as, as uh, in a little NATO costume, uh, as it does on things like this today. Um, the question for NATO is not necessarily about Finland joining it, it's about what's going on closer to Turkey and how long that situation where you've essentially got two, you know, Erdogan and NATO moving in two very separate directions uh, can sustain itself. And the question for Putin, as ever, here is, is there an exit strategy for him um, that allows him to stay in power. And until the answer to that second one is settled, satisfiedly to Putin's to Putin's satisfaction. It's been a long day. Um, until that question is satisfied to Putin's satisfaction, we're going to be talking about Ukraine and a frozen conflict in the east of that country for a very long time. It's interesting you mentioned Turkey there because, of course, uh, Turkey is threatening to veto Sweden's accession to NATO for, well, because they say that Sweden is harbouring Kurdish terrorists, which on the face of it seems an odd odd thing mm. to for Turkey to allege but do you think it's, that Sweden is going to be held up in the accession process? I'm sure it'll be held up in the accession process but I can't imagine that is going to prevent the other members of NATO forcing this through. The question is of course 
Erdogan has been a rogue actor when it comes to the response to the Russian war in Ukraine. He has turned, if not a blind eye, you know, an active, <laughs> turned an active eye towards Russia's aggression and not stepped in in the way that the rest of the West has when you look at the way they're dealing with shipping through the Bosphorus and so on and so mm. forth. Um, I don't want to give the impression that this is in somehow bad news for, for NATO that Finland has joined, um, but there are more pressing questions, I think, that, that they need to deal with beyond beyond the accession of what is a, a lovely country that you should all visit. Heidi Alexander. Yes, yeah, so I think that Putin has basically achieved the exact opposite to that which he set out to achieve when he invaded Ukraine. He has essentially strengthened the alliance of democracies that makes up NATO and he, when he invaded Ukraine, he was wanting to undermine it. So it has pretty spectacularly backfired. Interesting to see what happens with this process of, of Sweden joining. Um, but, you know, NATO is you know clearly incredibly important to our security in Europe. Um, and I think it's quite a historic day, Finland joining. And do you think Putin realises that he's made a, a fundamental mistake or do you think he's still being fed by his military people, sort of all the, all the good news, if there is any good news, and, and he doesn't quite understand how catastrophic it has been for Russia? I mean, who knows what's going on in the Kremlin? I mm. think, you know, we can all um, guess as to what is happening. Um, I, I suspect he does realise that this isn't going exactly the way that he wanted it to go. Um, you know, I do I do think that when he set out on the invasion of Ukraine, he expected it to be over in a matter of days or weeks. And sadly for that country, uh, they are still living through it. Um, and, you know, the huge conflict that is still going on there. There's a follow-up question here from Chris in Brecon, who says, does another Donald Trump presidency represent the biggest threat to Western and European political, military and social alliances for almost 80 years? Because, of course, we know Donald Trump has never been a fan of NATO. I think... I don't wish to put words in his mouth, but I'm going to anyway. Um, I think he would have happily withdrawn America from NATO, but couldn't quite get to do that. Um, Michael, do you think a second Trump presidency might embolden him? Yeah, and it does seem to me a little bit risky that the Europeans do seem to be really throwing their lot in with the Americans at this point in time. I mean, especially with the Labour Party sort of saying, NATO is sacrosanct. No, I'm not saying we should leave NATO, but I do think we should be flexible when it comes to foreign policy alliances, especially when you've got an ally such as the United States, where it's not just about Trump, but it's a two-party system, and one of the parties is completely off the wall, right? So, so the idea that we have a solid, unbreakable alliance with this country, to me, you know, it doesn't seem particularly smart. I think it's also worth when we're talking about, you know, the war in Ukraine. Yes, Putin has made a catastrophic error. Yes, he's getting a bloody nose here. But we also have to think, what's the way out? How is this going to end? It's not really good enough for us to just sort of say, yip de doo da day this bad guy has, has taken a hit. How are we going to find a solution which isn't just an eternal war? Because that does seem to be what we're heading for at the moment. So I feel like the cheerleading for NATO versus the bad Putin, yes, I mean, there's obviously some truth to it, but that's not really how we should be doing foreign policy. Greg? Well, I, I have to defend Trump a bit here. You know, his, his complaints about have to. NATO. <laughs> well, no, no, and I don't mm. do it just by nature. I just, I pick my issues, you know, and I think what, what Trump, Trump's delivery, his messaging is always clumsy. So saying, threatening that he was, you know, going to withdraw the U.S. from NATO, I don't think he was serious. I think that what, what he was saying is that a lot of the NATO countries weren't spending 2% of their GDP on defense, which they should be. Some of them have upgraded a bit and have joined the 2% club. Some of them, some of them still have it. So I think if anything, Trump would be thrilled that Finland is joining because they have a, they are very tough people and, and they have a very well-developed military. And I, I don't know what the GDP number there is there, but I'm guessing it's a lot higher than 2%. So, you know, these are complaints that, that are delivered, again, in a clumsy manner. He, he had the, you know, set the sit down in 2018 with the Germans where he complained about that, that they were not, near, you know, spending, the, you know, biggest, biggest uh, economy in, in Europe was not spending their 2% of GDP. Complained that they were buying too much energy from the Russians. Everybody made fun of him. Turns out he had a point on both issues. But what about his relationship with Vladimir Putin? Because he has said recently, hasn't he, that well, if he became president, the Ukraine war would be finished within a few days. And that's that's classic Trump blunder. You know, I mean, it's you know, take him 
what, is, what did they say? Take them, don't take them literally, but take them seriously. You know, there is some merit to the argument that some of these things might not have happened if Trump was still in. He was very generous with military support for the Ukrainians after the Obama administration, which would only send non-lethal support in trucks from Poland without U.S. flags on them. You know, so there, there was some, there, there was very, a lot of caution on the, on, in the Obama administration in terms of support for Ukraine. What, what Trump did was he would speak about relationships with Putin and I can work it out and, you know, that horrible visit in, in Finland. And yet he was actually much more deliberate in, you know, he, he punished Russia in Syria. He supported Ukraine with, with um, Javelin missiles and other military, you know, lethal support. So, you know, it's, it's sometimes, I know it's painful, but sometimes you have to look at what he does and what he's accomplished and not at what he says, because what he says is sometimes is quite often clumsy. Fair comment, Heidi? Well, I'm not sure, actually, because, I, I, you know, I think we live in 2023 and what the leader of America, the president of America says can have far reaching ramifications on geopolitics. What has struck me about the last 24 hours is for the first time in two years, I've woken up um, with Donald Trump on the airwaves again, leading the news bulletins. And I just reflected upon the fact that, uh, you know, since Joe Biden has been president, I haven't been waking up in the morning worrying about what the president of the United States has said overnight, because I actually do feel that when he was president, the, you know, things could have gone quite badly wrong in the world. Well, to be fair to him, he didn't get involved in a war, did he? Unlike most of his predecessors. Yeah, look, <laughs> I... Good point. You know, I, I just feel that there was huge volatility and instability with him in the White House. Um, and I, you know, I do feel that, you know, Joe Biden is a safer pair of hands there. And, you know, seeing Trump back on uh, the airwaves again uh, just makes me breathe a huge sigh of relief, to be honest. Um, Andy Sylvester, when, when you look at the unity between NATO countries over Ukraine. I think that surprised a lot of people. But of course, the election, re-election of Donald Trump could, could shatter that again. I mean, it might be uni united against him, but if, if Donald Trump, uh, contrary to what Greg says, does seek to undermine NATO again, that would be incredibly mm. serious for European security. Yeah, of course it would be. Um, but following on from the points made, it's a little column A, a little column B, isn't it? You know, Donald Trump was lashing out publicly at NATO when NATO was not a unified force against Ukraine. It didn't have anything to unify against. And frankly, I think a lot of people, and I confess I was one of these people, could never quite see a war in continental Europe happening again, it, because there's, there's just too many reasons it wouldn't. Um, I was wrong. Many European leaders were wrong. Um, was Trump right? Did he think this would ever happen? Who, who's to say? Um, at the same time, I agree with Heidi that words do matter. Um, Trump hurt an awful lot of feelings. Um, in some ways, particularly with the German comment about, about military spending, I think if he came back to office tomorrow, he would continue to hurt Germany's feelings, which has talked a tremendously good game about upping its military capacity and has done square root of not a lot since, since um, the invasion of Ukraine. Would it fracture the Western alliance? I think you would hope that in the face of a possibly mad fascist in the Kremlin, um, European leaders will be able to get their feelings hurt a little bit more than perhaps they would in the past. I do not think that even a Trump presidency would lead to the, you know, the, the exit of the United States from NATO. I think, if anything, it would, um, it would probably lead to more bellicose rhetoric and perhaps more, how can I put this, external leadership. There's always internal leadership of organisations. There's also people who lead it from the outside. Well, I suppose it might encourage European countries to actually pay for their own defences rather than rely on the United States, uh, which we've done ever since the Second World War, really. Uh, thank you very much for those questions. We'll move on to another subject in just a moment with our panel. If you'd like to ask them a question, the number to call 0345 6060 973. It's 17 minutes past eight. LBC.
debate on LBC, uh, Labour candidate for Swindon South. Is it South Swindon or Swindon South? Does it matter? Well, it's currently South Swindon, but if the boundary changes go through, it could be Swindon South. So <laughs> just go for whatever you prefer, Ian. <laughs> you say tomato, I say tomato. <laughs> exactly. Right. This is Heidi Alexander we're talking about. Greg Swenson is here from Republicans Overseas UK. Andy Sylvester is editor of City AM. And Michael Walker is from Navarra Media. Let's go to Ben in Clacton. Hello, Ben. Hello, Ian, and good evening, panel. My question is, how can we trust Rishi Sunak's pledges when a pledge was made in 2021 to fund social care? It was 500 million. It's now been cut by half to 250 million. Obviously, bed blocking will go up. Um, So why do you think he's done that? Is the, I mean, Boris Johnson obviously was Prime Minister then. I suppose you could argue, well, it, it, okay, it's the same party in government, but it is a different government. Um, so they will have their own priorities. Now, like you, I would have thought social care ought to be a main priority. But um, uh, Heidi Alexander, let's start with you on this free open goal for you. Well, I don't think we can trust Rishi Sunak's promises, and I don't think we can trust the Conservatives' promises on social care. And the question that I would ask is, how much longer are we going to try and kick this can down the road? We've got a huge number of people in this country, older people, disabled people, who are going out, going without the care packages that they need. We've got massive workforce challenges. I think today the figure came out that it was over 160,000 vacancies in the social care workforce. To put it bluntly, people can earn more stacking shelves at Tesco's than they earn caring for people and providing dignity to older people and disabled people. Um, And we also know, of course, that last year the government got rid of the cap that they said that they were going to introduce on catastrophic care costs. So people who perhaps get Alzheimer's um, dementia when they're older um, and can spend over £100,000 on their care um, in the Jeremy Hunt budget, he had to get rid of that because of the absolutely catastrophic mess that Liz Truss had made um, with the economy. And so um, I don't think we can trust them. I do think it has to be sorted for exactly the reasons that your caller has pointed out. Um, The pressure that we're experiencing in the NHS at the moment uh, is linked directly to the crisis in social care. There are a huge number of people who are medically fit to be discharged from hospital Um, But because the residential care isn't available or the care in people's homes isn't available, they can't be moved out of hospital and that causes this huge backlog. So you can't move people from A&E into the wards because you can't move people out from the wards into social care. And so, you know, I do think that we have got to find a way of tackling this on a cross-party basis. You know, I remember when I was first elected as a Member of Parliament in Lewisham in 2010, we were having discussions about this then. 13 years have gone by, the situation's got worse and worse. And so I think it's pretty disgraceful what they've done, backtracking on the promises that they made. Andy Sylvester. Uh, I mean, they've done it because there's no money. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but there isn't any. Um, you can always find money to... in the Treasury if you really need to. Uh, can't you, you can. I mean, and, I mean can, was... 250 million, that is chicken feed in yeah, terms well, of Treasury I mean, budget. Well, it's certainly chicken feed in terms of the NHS budget, which is, of course, where these two budgets are supposed to be joined up. Um, uh, parking the d- dreadful precedent of a politician not entirely telling the truth and possibly doing something other than what you said, which I could never imagine happening before. Um, arguing about whether 250 million or 500 million, the implication of this argument is that if it was half a billion quid that we managed to find, then all, all would be well and all would be solved. And that's mad. I mean, we're, it's like arguing whether this asteroid that we're staring at called a completely broken and wildly expensive NHS and an ageing population and an ungrowing economy is going to take us out by landing in Sussex or Surrey. There has to be, I agree, a cross-party commission. There also has to be some honesty. We need to stop saying the NHS is in crisis and pointing at the Tories or whoever is in power. Because I can promise if the Labour win, if Labour Party win in two years, in a year's time, in a year's time, the NHS is still going to be in crisis because the thing is broken. Because we don't have the capacity within our politics to reform it. Um, and I, I, I'm afraid I haven't heard anything from Keir Starmer that suggests to me that if he's in charge, he would do anything other than find some more cash in the Treasury, pump it into this gigantic black hole, and we'll be exactly where we are in five years' time, but with an older population and an even slower-growing economy. So 
I'm a little tired of these funding rows over, as you put it, chicken feed, when no one's willing to actually do any content. You are sounding very tired, Andy. I know, it's been a long time. <laughs> Editing a daily newspaper is a challenging business. <laughs> I cool. Now, I, I, I hate this phrase that increasing funding for the NHS is putting money into a black hole, because it's not. It's paying the wages of doctors and nurses and NHS staff to care for people you... and to operate on them, right? So, it's not so, doing so, that so, anymore. So, well, well, it clearly is doing that. And, 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 and to defend, you know, I'm not particularly a new Labourite, but if you want to see can the NHS work, you just have to look at New Labour. Like, I think they did a lot wrong. I don't think they should have gone to war in Iraq. But when you look at Navarro Media, when, for well, when you look statement. at when you look at people's satisfaction with the NHS by the end of 2010, it was incredibly high. We had a health service which, which in some studies, was top of the league tables. In other studies, was mid table. But no one was saying that this was a completely broken system. Famously, what has happened, the, the, what has happened now? We've had an aging population, which means we're going to have to spend more of our GDP on health. The Tories, mm -hmm. until the last two years, when they're flooding it with money, but obviously, if you you know if you if you grind something down to break point, then flooding it with money over a two-year period is not going to suddenly get rid of the, the the waiting list because you have to train people, you have to employ people. That's not how this thing works. So I do think if we had a settlement where we funded the NHS properly, then that would take us a long way. We don't so really which, need to reinvent which, the wheel. Which schools are you closing? Which well, I would increase... And this, is, this, this would be my beef with... No, I don't want to sound too new Labour here because this would be my beef with, with Keir Starmer and the Labour Party at the moment is they're not being honest with this, which is that if we want to have a decent health service when we've got an ageing population, we are going to have to increase taxes and we're going to have to especially increase taxes on the rich, right? And if the, we've got a tax burden that's at a 70-year high... Yeah, but so we've, also got, much lower, we've also got a much lower tax burden than many of the countries which we might look at and say, oh, actually, their health system works pretty well. Yeah, right? but so, largely because so they if have systems that blend private and public, and that's apparently well, so heresy the, in the British... Well, I don't think it needs system. to be heresy. So there, there, there are health systems which work OK, which are social insurance systems and NHS systems when they're funded properly, as they were um, under, under Labour governments. There's a health system which doesn't work, which is the American model. I think we all agree we don't want that. Mm. So you can have social insurance, you can have a national health service. We could spend loads and loads of money switching to a social insurance system which you know isn't really in our culture or our economic structures or we could just say let's tax the rich a little bit more so we can fund the nhs properly and if you fund it properly for about five years i can pretty much guarantee you the waiting lists are going to come down greg do you look on do you look at this with a slight degree of amusement or no i i, I never look at at the safety net with any kind of amusement it's what you know the, the problem with safety net is once you make those commitments you have to stick to them so you know, I get it, but I'm with Andy on this one. There's no money. And if you raise taxes on the so-called rich or the corporations, the revenues will go down. So if you want to, if you want more revenue, this is the great model. I mean, I, have to, I hate to get all supply sider on you, but if, if you lower the rate on the rich, because they're productive and they invest and they have already paid taxes on their money, well, usually, um, and, and lower the corporate rate, the revenues will go up. And that's what we all want, right? We want more. I mean, I'm sounding very 1980s. I'm not sure it, that it is a throwback. It, really it is stands. a throwback. I know I'm sounding like Liz Truss, but nothing wrong but, with the 1980s. Michael. But when you raise the the corporate rate, for example, revenues are either flat or go down. So lower the rates, mm. you'll get more revenue, which the left should want. More stuff to spend, more money to spend on. I want to tax wealth because you can't move it, right? Difficult to tax wealth. Really difficult. And and unintended consequences too like you'll hide it or you you know there's there's always ways to get Don't around tax us but if you lower the rate the revenues will go up and i think that's what the left would want more revenues for the government um, just to say, Donald Trump has just left the courtroom in Manhattan. He got straight into his car. His motorcade has now driven off. He didn't say anything to reporters, having been warned by the judge about his use of language. I'd like to hear the reaction to that. Now, we are expecting the Manhattan District Attorney to make a public statement in the next few minutes, uh, which we will bring to you uh, when we get it. Uh, we're told it's half past eight, but uh, these things often drift a little bit, don't they? So, in the meantime, let's get the LBC News headlines from Tim Daly. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty after being formally arrested in New York and put before a courtroom in Manhattan. It's been hearing he faces 34 charges of falsifying business records. It follows an investigation into hush money allegedly paid to an adult movie actress in 2016. In the last few minutes, it's also emerged the judge he was appearing before has warned him about his use of language and the targeting of legal figures on social media. And a former Metropolitan Police officer has been found guilty 
guilty of raping a woman. 26-year-old Ireland Murdoch was dismissed last year after he searched for her name in a police database. LBC weather, outbreaks of rain for West Scotland and Northern Ireland tonight. Patchy rain spreading east, but staying dry in the southeast, a low of minus one degree. This is LBC. Three on LBC. Just to bring you up to date, Donald Trump is uh, being driven, presumably, to one of the New York airports, where he will then be flying back to Florida to Mar-a-Lago, where he's going to make a public uh, statement at 1:15 UK time tomorrow morning. I think I'm going to stay up for that. I think that could be quite sparky. And um, we are expecting the District Attorney of Manhattan to make a public statement outside the courtroom at some point in the next. Well could be the next minute, it could be the next half an hour. I don't know, but we will bring it to you when we can. Right, uh, panel on cross-question, let me just reintroduce them to you. Uh, Heidi Alexander is here. She's standing for South Swindon in uh, the next election. Now, you were MP for Lewisham. That's right. You quit being an MP for Lewisham. You weren't defeated. That's right. Because of Jeremy Corbyn, wasn't it, really? Well, I was offered a job by Sadiq Khan, who is the Mayor of London, as his deputy, being responsible for transport, and as someone that went into politics to make a difference. Um, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. I think it's probably pretty well known that I wasn't Jeremy Corbyn's <laughs> number one fan. I was the first person to resign from his shadow cabinet um, back in 2016. Um, so I spent three and a half years yeah, working with Sadiq in City Hall. And you want to get back in. And uh, I mean, did, did, you, did you immediately miss the House of Commons? No, not immediately. I think I spent three and a half years working with Sadiq um, and everyone at Transport for London, a brilliant team there. We kept the buses and the tubes running through COVID. We uh, eventually got the Elizabeth line open, which is absolutely fantastic. I haven't been on it yet. 
you haven't. No, it is everyone amazing. says it's great. fantastic. It is, it is great. Um, but I, after COVID, I guess I thought to myself, I'm 47 years old. What do I want to do Never. with the rest of my I am? Never. Yeah, this grey hair definitely <laughs> tells its own story. And so I, yeah, I miss the sense of mission that you get from being a member of parliament. And I realised that unless we win in places like South Swindon, we are not going to form a Labour government next time. Of course, that's where you were born and brought up. I was born and brought up. And so I was selected last summer to be the candidate there. So, yeah, it's all good fun. Greg Swenson is with us from Republicans Overseas UK, Andy Sylvester is from City AM and Michael Walker from Navarra Media. Um, now you're either going to like this next question, Heidi, or you're going to hate it. It's Robert in Chiswick. Robert, hello, what would you like to ask? Yeah, good evening Ian, thank you for taking my call. Good evening panel. Um, my question to the panel is I'd like to get their views on Sadiq Khan pushing ahead with the ULEZ expansion despite the cost of living crisis that we're seeing at the moment, please. Now, the judgment on an attempt by the London boroughs of Bexley, Bromley, Harrow and Hillingdon and also Surrey County Council to secure an injunction to prevent the ULA's expansion taking place in late August is apparently imminent. And, of course, the uh, ULA stands for the ultra-low emission zone. It was first introduced in 2019 when you were London's Deputy Mayor for Transport, Heidi. Now, it's very interesting that this has provoked... A huge controversy, particularly among our London listeners. I mean, mm -hmm. every day I'm getting emails, texts about it. It's really created a lot of controversy. Now, mm -hmm. you presumably were behind this. And do you think it should still go ahead in its current form or should there be a pause? So when I was the Deputy Mayor, we introduced the Ultra Low Emission Zone in central London in the same area as the congestion charging zone. That came in in 2019 and then in 2021 we expanded it out to the North and South Circular. When I left City Hall, the Mayor and my successor, Seb Dance, and the Board at Transport for London had a discussion about what next in terms of emissions charging in London and the mayor decided to extend it to the Greater London Boundary. I think the ultra-low emission zone had an utterly transformative effect on air pollution in central London, and I think that people in outer London deserve clean air in the same way as people in inner London do. Um, I know very well um, the family of um, Ella Kissa Deborah, who um, sadly died um, from asthma related conditions. Um, and there was a, a judgment basically that her death was linked to really, really horrific air quality. Last time we talked about this, her mother phoned in. Yeah, um, oh. Rosamond. Yeah. Um, and Rosamond has been making the case that, you know, this shouldn't just be the pres of clean air of, of people in, in inner and central London. What I would say is that about nine in ten vehicles will meet the emission standards that are required by the ultra low emission zone. So not every vehicle that's coming in to London or driving in Greater London is going to be charged. It's a small minority of vehicles. We also see, saw a really rapid acceleration in the vehicle fleet cleaning itself up people buying new cars, new vehicles, in order to be compliant and not have but, but to what face do you, the What job. do you say to the many people I, who've got small businesses who do rely on vehicles that don't qualify? Um, so, obviously, no the Mayor charge. of London has put £50 million into a scrappage scheme and um, small businesses can apply. Certainly when I was in City Hall, we targeted that scheme on the smallest businesses and charities to help them with purchasing a cleaner vehicle so that they could be compliant. You know, I do understand that it's a difficult time for businesses at the moment and in terms of household finances with everything going on with the cost of living, yeah, I get it, um, but I do think that the the mayor has been really quite bold and brave in saying we do need to clean up London's air. We also need to tackle climate change and carbon emissions. 25% uh, of carbon emissions in the UK 
come from uh, transport. Okay. And so I think he's been bold and he's been brave. Um, and I think the scrappage fund is the right thing to do. I'd also like to see government actually fund a scrappage fund in, in South East England. Um, what the government have done is basically just throw money towards their mates in other parts of the country instead of establishing a national scrappage fund. And I think that's okay. what they should be doing. Andy Sylvester, is this exercising your readers? As exercising our readers, to be honest, no, not particularly, um, just because our readers tend to be business folk who don't necessarily have to deal with some of these issues. Um, Hiley is right that the fleet of cars on the road is obviously cleaning itself up. You know, it just stands to reason that that will continue to happen in outer London. Um, the scrappage scheme is relatively generous. I think there are a lot of people just outside the borders, as highly alluded to, so I think of places like Epsom or down in, just as you cross the border into Kent, that are worried, quite rightly, that as a small business that has to operate in London, they're going to have to drive in um, and will not get the benefit from us. There is, there's just no, there's never a good time. There's never a good time to do something like this. There's never a good time to say to people that we're going to charge you more. Um, Against all of my instincts, and genuinely all of my instincts, um, having gone to a school next to a very busy road in Sutton and out of London, um, I've been running around parks there as an 11, 12-year-old, um, that were you know, next to idling cars sat by the bus stop for a long time. I doubt it was good for me. Um, That's why you're so tired. That's <laughs> why I'm so tired. I was just looking at the South London upbringing is what's made me so tired. Um, no, look, I, I, I can completely feel the sympathy. I think the scrappage scheme, scheme could be more generous. But look, uh, again, it's sort of, we're arguing about one step towards what we all know is coming in five to ten to 15 to 20 years, which is a road pricing scheme based on how green your car is. That's effectively where we're getting to. Mm. Um, and ULES is using the same technology that can be used to do that. So if people think that that's the start of a slippery slope, then they can think it's the start of a slippery slope. But that's just the nature of it. Okay. Greg Swenson. Hard to argue for, for taxes that, that Michael mentioned, you know, taxing the rich or corporations that will slow growth and development and, and actually slow revenues. But I especially don't like regressive taxes, you know, mm. which this ultimately is when you're taxing working people and small businesses. And small businesses are the driver of job growth, typically. And so I, I, I just can't endorse that you know when when and but what about the argument which i mean andy and heidi both said well it's, it's effectively it's very difficult to argue against clean air and if, if this if if this is as transformational as heidi says it was in central london why would anyone be against it well, because it's a tax on working people and small business. Yeah, you know, so the, it's, the other it's just thing to remember tax. about car ownership in yeah. London is that um, you are more likely to own a car the wealthier you are. So the, the poorer you are, the less likely you are Correct. to own a car full stop. Yeah. Um, and so for you to say this is a regressive tax, I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure that's true. Yeah. But I think the, the context, we were talking about small business. So, you know, I don't know the numbers on the percentages of cars that are affected and how rich or poor they are. But generally speaking, more regulation and regressive taxation is going to be, you know, the, the people that suffer the most are typically yeah, well, it, working people. It, in the, in the it is business. by definition a regressive tax because it's a flat fee. And therefore, if you have less money, it hits more. That's... That's just the definition of yeah. regressive tax. I think the point about car ownership is fine. I think, actually, the more I think about this, the, the people I feel sorry for are the people that are not going to have access to this scrappage scheme at all, that are just outside that border, that have to come into London. And my answer to that would naturally be to expand London um, and the remits of the mayor and London's central government, so and London's government, so that it has the power to do more things and raise more cash within both its area and the hinterland just outside I'm it. sure Sadiq would agree with you. Uh, Michael Walker. I think, um, first of all, let's just push back against this idea that you can't have higher taxes and growth. I mean, lots of the countries that have much higher incomes than us also have higher levels of tax, right? So if you want to live mm. in a healthy, wealthy society, there is nothing wrong with having higher levels of tax. Look at Germany, look at France, etc., etc. Wouldn't it be great if we were protesting about our pension age rising from 62 to 64 instead of taking 67 as sort of the given? Um, but, but on this issue of, of, of ULES and ultra-low emission zone, I can't drive. I'm not actually on top of the, the politics we have of, no right to of, of, of driving in this country. Mm -hmm. I do live in a low-traffic neighbourhood, um, which I really enjoy, nice. um, where my parents are from in late, and that one of, one of their big roads got turned into a low-traffic neighbourhood. I think the business argument 
argument is strange because everyone always says, oh, if people can't drive to the shops, the shops are going to lose money. The road, which is a low traffic neighborhood, is, has flourished since the cars have stopped going down it. You now have like kids running around in the street. It feels feels very continental. Um, so I'm, I'm very pro the politics of making London less car friendly and more people friendly. This is the delivery question, though, isn't it, for small businesses? It's those, it's A, you know, people, tradesmen coming in, blah, 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 to work in London, but it's also the knock on effect for small businesses because the price of what they're buying from small suppliers using polluting fleets, et cetera, might go up. It's worth saying, that you're right, the big businesses have already invested in green fleets because, yeah, as you know, because they've all got bloody they love, they love right. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. It is difficult. There is a mayoral election in May of next year. Fundamentally, rightly or wrongly, Sadiq Khan has made a choice. He's made no bones about making a choice. Um, and I dare say there will be some consequences from some people and if the Tory candidate whoever that is and I know there are ongoing live discussions about who that might be comes in and promises to repeal ULES then that is what democracy is about and I just wonder how significant I, I agree it is a big issue in that belt around London I just wonder mm. whether it is sort of in, and, and, in inner and, London you know without going all political analysis oh, it's on. one out of ten people in in that belt that will have to pay it and once people start to feel oh hang on do I not have to pay it oh I've got a greener car Maybe they, maybe it disappears as an issue. We shall see. We will indeed. Um, thank you very much for your answers on that. We'll move on. Robert, thank you for your question. It's 8.45. LBC. Of Heidi Alexander, Greg Swenson, Andy Sylvester and Michael Walker with us answering your questions. The next one is a text question from Paul in Paisley. Can the party responsible for emancipation and for votes for women in America ever be respectable again? Let's ask the head of Republicans yeah. Overseas UK, Greg no, I Swenson. I think it's quite respectable and it, I think you have to separate the 
Trump derangement syndrome from the party and from conservatives in America. So that, you know, the, the conservative movement is alive and well. You know, half the country voted for Republicans. You know, I can give you all the stats. You know, we picked up 14 seats in 2020. We picked up another, you know, handful in 2022. Yes, it's a divided country, but people aren't necessarily voting Republican because of Trump. In fact, if anything, he was a, you know, an electoral liability in 2018, 20, and 22. So the party's alive and well, and I think the conservative movement is alive and well, and I think you'll see, you'll see that in, in the elections, whether it's Trump or Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley or whoever. You know, let the process work. Let but Ronald Reagan, um, George H.W. Bush, Richard Nixon, I would suggest also, yeah. are probably spinning in their respective graves at the moment at the way the Republican Party has developed over the last 20 years. It's become um, l less of a political party, more of a quasi-religious sect, hasn't it? I mean, it's so ideological yeah. that it's lost touch with the people, that the centrist people who used to vote for it. Well, I, I think that the ideology hasn't really changed that much. In fact, many will argue that it's the same old, you know, it's the, as Michael pointed out, it's, it's you know, giving my eight, 1980s back. But the ide ideology hasn't changed that much. I think the Democrats have moved very far to the left. What's changed is that, and this is what, what happened with Trump in 2016, he, he appealed to the sort of common man, you know, the, the people that had been forgotten about, the Rust Belt, if you want to call it that. And that's something that the establishment Republicans had, had overlooked. So I don't think there's a lot of change in policy. It's not extreme in terms of policies. It's just, it's just changed in terms of who the appeal is to. So all of a sudden, in, in a generation, and this might annoy George W. Bush, who went to Yale, but it's the party now of the working man as opposed to the party of the country club. And that's what's changed. And so, and now the, the Democrats have a lock on college educated, high earning, you know, college grads. And, and that's, you know, that's different. It used to be the other way around. I mean, so that's what's changed. Michael it's Walker, that is a fair point, isn't it? If you look at where it's, and it's a little bit similar here, if you look back at the 2019 election, where the Conservatives had 47% of the working class vote and Labour only had 32%. Similar phenomenon as Greg is saying in America. But, I mean, obviously you're not going to be very pro-Republican, but do you, do you see that there, could, there is a way back in terms of the Republican Party moving back to the centre, or do you think it, it's made its bed and it will lie in it? I mean, it seems very difficult to see how it would get anywhere else. I mean, it seems a bit like a party out of control, I have to say. I also think we we shouldn't look, you know, too warmly on Republicans who might have been a bit more respectable when it came to the language they use. I mean, we were talking earlier about words mattering. I, I do think words matter, but actions matter more. Mm -hmm. And George W. Bush, for all he's celebrated now as this person who, who seems to speak like how we imagine a president to speak, he did start an incredibly deadly war in the Middle East, which has killed many more people than Trump but, would. Never mind. Yeah. Sorry, I was, I was talking about W. <laughs> yeah. um, I suppose on the question of the working class, I mean, the, the statistic you just used there with reference to 2019, I think that's potentially a little bit of an outdated sort of measure of class because it's all about are you a manual worker or a service worker. Now what that will do is it will class lots of poor people in the inner city who work in very low paid service jobs um, as middle class. So you have someone working in a call centre would be middle class by that basis. So what we are seeing though it is a genuine change which is there are people, especially white people in sort of semi-rural areas or suburban areas, smaller towns who have moved away from left-wing parties and towards, um, well, in this country, the Conservatives when Brexit was the big issue and now to Donald Trump when, um, you know, opposition to, to trade deals and migration is the big issue. That is a problem for the Democrats, for the Labour Party here. I don't think it's fair, though, to say that the Republicans or the Conservatives have become the party of the working man. Still, by a long way, wealthier people disproportionately vote for the Republicans and wealthy people disproportionately vote for the Conservatives here. The issue is there's this particular group of people who are who used to vote for the left-wing parties and now tend yeah. to vote for the right-wing parties, especially because of cultural issues. Also, many of them are homeowners, right? So there is also a sort of economic angle. Mm. Um, I'm going to ask you two to be quite brief and then mm. we can fit in another question. Andy, then Heidi. It just looks like sports teams in the States now, doesn't it? I mean, the most... And you see it with Trump. You, you see... Yeah, an awful lot of people who would not traditionally have been overly thrilled to see their favoured candidate or a candidate attached to their favoured party being in front of a 
you know, a dingy courtroom in Manhattan over paying hush money to a porn star, which is definitely something that Gerald Ford wouldn't have done. <laughs> uh, a man who I wrote about in your excellent book, The President. You and, did, and a very good essay um, it was too, if I may. Um, but you never feel, you know, both, both sides at the moment feel completely under threat. They're like sports fans who are annoyed that a referee's decision has gone the wrong way, and they're just convinced that they will keep, if they will keep fighting because they feel this injustice. How America brings itself back to being one political system is an interesting question. If you look around the world in terms of the divides in ideology across, you know, cultural issues, economic issues, there's not many two-party countries left. Ours is one, effectively, and the US is another. And in those two systems, we have pretty nasty politics. So um, maybe the whole thing needs to split. We've had a statement from Donald Trump's lawyer who describes the indictment as, quote, disappointing and sad. Sad is a very Donald Trump word, isn't it? Heidi? <laughs> well, I think what's interesting, if not slightly terrifying, is that this whole process of him being in court about these hush payments to a porn star seems to be actually making him more popular with the Republican base and increasing his chances of getting the Republican nomination. I think he actively in feeds off of conspiracy, division, you know, mistrust of experts... Um, and I think that's a very, very dangerous place for just, politics to get to. Just on that, um, apparently his next court hearing has been set for the 4th of December, which seems an awfully long time ahead, but of course it's only two months before the Republican primaries right. start, so that, I mean, that could have quite an impact. Um, let, let's move on to a final question. It's from Chris in Stubbington, who says, does the panel think to give a 270-hour community sentence to a man who raped a schoolgirl when he was 17 and she was 13 is an embarrassment to the Scottish justice system? Um, th this is, uh, I first saw this this morning from a tweet from J.K. Rowling, who um, said that there, there is apparently a system in Scotland where if you're under 25, uh, you are less likely to receive a punitive sentence for all sorts of different reasons. Um, Heidi, let's start with you on this. I'm gobsmacked by it, to be honest. I'm not an expert in the Scottish legal system. Um, I understand that there's a process where the Crown can potentially challenge whether this sentence was appropriate, but the idea that someone rapes a 13-year-old girl and gets a community sentence, I don't think anyone in the UK, be they in Scotland, England or Wales, would think that was appropriate. I, I don't know the details of well, the, the case. Well, the judge in the it, case said, um, to uh, when delivering his um, sentencing, he says, you're a first-time offender with no previous history of prison. You're 21 and was 17 at the time. Prison does not lead me to believe that this will continue uh, to contribute to your rehabilitation. Michael. Yeah, I mean, on, on the face of it, it does seem outrageous. I mean, there's there's a number of worrying... Why did it take four years from the crime to the sentencing also, to me, raises questions. I wonder what's happened there. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, this, on the face of it, does seem appalling. I suppose it's important to say that, you know, we can focus on sentencing. The bigger issue when it comes to sexual offences, to me, seems to be investigation and charging. So only 1% of allegations of rape get mm -hmm. to a charge, let alone a, a guilty conviction. So while I think the outrage at this is, is perfectly justified, I do think potentially there's a different part of the criminal justice system which is more outrageous mm. than the sentences that are being handed out. Andy? Yeah, it's outrageous. And I agree with Michael on the general police attitude across... Well, not police attitude, police capability when it comes to sexual assault. So, I mean, this was somebody who was brought to justice, found I, guilty, this, and then the victim and her family, I would have thought, will feel incredibly let down and thinking, well, is that it? Is, is, I mean, was it worth I, going through I, all of this I, for this? I don't think that anyone would dispute that. I mean, it just, on the face of it, seems barking. There are... I mean, the actual concept of, you know punishments for, you know, there are enough kids who have done something stupid that have landed them in prison and it's changed their lives for the worse. And our prison system is not really fit for purpose either. I'm going through quite a list today of things that aren't fit for purpose, but in this case, no, quite obviously, um, that is someone that should have been banged up. And I, 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 Greg? Yeah, I think there's a risk when you when you start treating criminals as the victims. And, and, and there is some merit to the fact that maybe this, if this young man has already served four years, then that's a different conversation. Well, he hasn't. But, okay, then, then yeah, all the more horrendous that he's not done a day in jail. And then the question is, should he be on the street? Should he be out in society until he's properly rehabilitated? But this is what happens. It doesn't matter how good your police force is. If you have a DA like Alvin Bragg or Kim Fox in Chicago or 
Chase of Bodine in San Francisco, who was recalled, believe it or not, in very democratic San Francisco, then it doesn't matter how many people you arrest if the prosecutors decide that they shouldn't be they shouldn't be indicted then they just go free and that's what's happening in america and then the same thing here if you have a great da that properly prosecutes the case but then the judge says well i'm not going to follow the laws i'm going to let him go so Judges and DAs should follow the law that's determined okay. by the legislatures. Um, right, we've had a very serious program today, but we're going to finish it off with, as usual, a fun question from Jenna in Manchester. Donald Trump is already selling T-shirts with a fake mugshot on them to raise campaign funds. If you were selling one piece of merch featuring a picture of you on it, what would it be and what would it say? I don't know if this has given you any ideas for your campaign in Swindon, Heidi. Well, I know I annoy my opponent, who is a Welsh man called Robert Buckland, by saying that I was born in Swindon, I went to school in Swindon. So my slogan has to be from Swindon, for Swindon. As to what the picture would be and what the piece of merchandise would be, I don't know, but that would definitely be the slogan. Greg? That's a tough one. I think I would have some kind of merch with my favourite football team on it or something like that, and but try to imply that I'm on the football team. Or the basketball team, or whatever it is. So it wouldn't have a photo of you on it, then. Well, it could have a, have one that you know, with with some heavy uniform on, so you can't see that I weigh ninety eight pounds. And... Uh, heavy uniform, Michael. I need mine to, boggles. I, I need a slogan that distinguishes myself from the panel. So I'm going to go for tax the rich. <laughs> I think that's a, a message we don't hear enough in this country at the moment. And a cap. I'd like a red cap, but I'm going to have a different font to Donald Trump because I don't want it to look too Trumpian. Yeah. Andy. A series of 1980s Big Bang themed merchandise <laughs> celebrating the cities. Uh, Study on. We can go head to head. Yeah. Thank you Good all stuff. very much indeed. Heidi Alexander, Greg Swenson, Andy Sylvester, and Michael Walker. We still haven't had this statement from the DA. If we get it, we'll bring it to you in the next 60 minutes. But over the next hour, we're going to talk about disowning someone from your own family or disowning a friend. Because today, Philip Schofield, the TV star, has disowned his own brother who was found guilty of sexually abusing a teenage boy over three years from the age of 13. Philip Schofield said in a statement on Instagram afterwards, as far as I'm concerned I no longer have a brother. I wonder if you've ever been in those circumstances where you felt the need to disown a family member or maybe it's you that's been the one that has been disowned by other people. How does that work? Because I can't imagine disowning a member of my family or a close member of my family literally for anything. Can you? 0345 6060 973. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC.